From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Israel preempts an attack by the Hezbollah terrorist group on its territory with precision targeting on rocket sites that were poised to fire at Israel. We'll talk about the latest military exchanges in the Middle East and how they'll affect the negotiations for a ceasefire in Gaza. Plus, it's the third anniversary of the terrorist attack in Kabul that killed 13 Americans trying to defend the chaotic U.S. evacuation from Afghanistan. Welcome. It's a foreign policy podcast day on Potomac Watch, uh, the daily Wall Street Journal opinion podcast. And I'm Paul Gigo, editorial page editor of the journal. And I'm here today with uh, my colleague, Elliot Kaufman, who's been closely following Middle East events with excellent sources in the region. Welcome, Elliot. Thank you. All right. Israel launched its preemptive strikes on the weekend against uh, Hezbollah sites in southern Lebanon, did not go into Beirut this time. Hezbollah responded with some drone attacks, but most of those were, or nearly all of them, were intercepted and did little damage in Israel. The one There was one casualty on the ground from debris, presumably from a missile interception or drone interception. Let's listen to Michael Herzog, the Israeli ambassador to the United States. On the strike. I believe that the, the success of our uh, operation yesterday prevented an escalation to a major war. The threat is still there. We still need a, um, a settlement uh, with Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. They followed Hamas by launching a war with Israel on October 8th, mm-hmm. and they have been firing thousands of rockets into Israel since then. We uh, give a chance to diplomacy, and we hope it works, uh, but if not, we have uh, nearly 70,000 people in Israel, northern Israel, away from their homes, refugees in their own country, and we have to make sure they can go back safely to their homes. Elliot, let's talk uh, first about the weekend preemptive attacks by Israel. It does look uh, here you know, nearly 48 hours later as if it really was a successful example of preemption. Because things are relatively quiet now. And we don't have to take Israel's word for it that Hezbollah had this whole plan to launch a major attack, not just on northern Israel, as they have been doing for some uh, time, but also central Israel. Hezbollah's own leader, Hassan Nasrallah, has said so. In fact, he said, you know, uh, our plan was to launch at 515 in the morning. Israel attacked at 4.45 a.m., right around there. So very close timetable here. It seems like from what we can tell, it was successful at destroying a lot of rockets, a lot of rocket launchers. Hezbollah still got over 200 rockets, a few uh, dozen drones out there at Israel, but a quantity that Israel could manage. And so, like you said, the results of this sort of long-feared retaliation, as Hezbollah frames it, ended up being far less than the worst case. And I think a lot of the credit for that has to go to the preemptive attack. So Hassan Nasrallah did speak after the exchange, and he, of course, claimed great victory against Israel and claimed that they accomplished what they wanted in northern Israel. But the problem he has is that they didn't do much. (laughs) And I don't know if that gets through at the grassroots in Lebanon, but it probably does to some extent because people know it wasn't an overwhelming successful attack on Israel. But the question becomes, why is Nasrallah willing to essentially stand down after this modest reprisal? Well, that's going to be the question, whether this attack was enough of a success to allow him to do so. That's how he framed it in public. He said, we are going to assess the results of this. And if it is found to be satisfactory, then we won't need to do a further retaliation. Now, he is claiming that those missiles got through and did great damage on Israeli military bases, Israeli intelligence bases, all across Israel. And Israel is simply covering up. But there's no evidence of that. There's no evidence of that. And especially off military base, if there were evidence, it would be all over social media. In a free society, you just can't cover up things like that anymore. So it's hard to believe, and the Lebanese don't seem to believe it, and that is Nasrallah's problem 
the incident of one of their rockets scoring a direct hit on an Israeli chicken coop in the north of Israel has sparked intense mockery of Hezbollah on Lebanese social media, that they can hit Israeli chickens. What about Israeli military? What about Israeli cities? And that's a problem for Nasrallah if he wants to walk away from this thing. Uh, so Israel, Israel did hit a couple of more sites in uh, Lebanon on Monday because they detected some more potential rocket launches. The other question that remains here is, what about Iran? Iran is the um, organizing actor of all of the proxies like Hezbollah, like Hamas, like the Houthis in the Middle East. And it has promised a painful response, I think was the direct quote, to the uh, Israeli assassination of Ismail Haniya, the uh, Hamas leader, on a visit to Tehran. That's what they promised. But We've been waiting for any kind of military response. The fear was that they'd launch another attack like the one in April that required enormous interception capabilities by the U.S., Jordan, and Israel. But they haven't launched anything like that. And after the Hezbollah attack this weekend, a spokesman for the uh, government in Tehran said, well, it was a great victory over Israel <laughs> by Hezbollah. Well, as victories go, you know, Israel will take that defeat. <laughs> but that's their story, and they seem to be, you know, sticking to it. Hezbollah is the crown jewel in the Iranian proxy network. It is more of a proxy of Iran than almost any of the other groups that we talk about, like, for instance, Hamas. I mean, Hezbollah is the Lebanese branch of Iran's Islamic revolution. It believes in the theological significance of the Iranian ayatollahs. And they're both Shiite. Exactly. So there is real control there. And so this Hezbollah response can be seen as part of the Iranian response, but at a distance. It certainly isn't the full Iranian direct response that was promised. The Israeli military assessment is that Iran will still respond at some point, but the further it gets, the weaker that response is likely to become. There is a sense that if it goes too long, Iran might even need an entirely new justification, some new provocation. Otherwise, I mean, people are going to forget about this thing. Are they really going to embroil Iran in something over an attack so far back? All right. We're going to take a break and we come back, talk a little more about potential Iranian response and also what impact will these uh, latest exchanges have on the negotiations for Gaza Cease fire when we come back. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo with The Wall Street Journal on our Potomac Watch daily podcast. I'm here with Elliot Kaufman. We're talking about events in the Middle East and also Afghanistan, the anniversary, three-year anniversary of that horrible death of 13 Americans uh, in Afghanistan. But let's talk about Iran. Elliot, we're talking a little bit about this waiting for the Iranian response. Now, the U.S. has deployed considerable military assets into the region since the assassination of Haniya. The USS Abraham Lincoln Carrier Strike Group has moved in to buttress the USS Roosevelt Aircraft Carrier Group Strike Group that is already there. Adds a message, obviously, to the uh, Iranians that it might not go well for you if you do launch an attack. Now, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, the Iranian leader, didn't address the operation on the weekend directly, but he said, quote, According to Iranian media, war has many forms. It doesn't always mean holding a gun. It means thinking correctly, speaking correctly, identifying correctly, aiming accurately. Now, you can read whatever you want into that, but it strikes me that what he's saying is we may not launch the same kind of attack we did in April against Israel, but we might bide our time and attack in other ways. And that means could potentially mean a assassination attempt of uh, Israeli officials. Uh, it could also mean uh, a terrorist attack on Israelis overseas, perhaps consulates or 
embassies or just Israeli citizens to, in prominent places to do some damage. Now, they did that years ago in Argentina. And remember the failed attempt of an assassination against Israeli officials in Washington, D.C., which was preempted by American arrests. What do you think? Yeah, and also of Saudi officials in Washington. Israel is entertaining all of these possibilities right now. I mean, Iran could try a repeat of April where they launched hundreds of ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, drones, but it didn't go so well. They had nothing to show for it. And if they would want to have something to show for it, they would have to launch a lot more probably. And then the worry is, could they do too much damage, invite a large Israeli response, even an American response? You know, those U.S. military assets are there for defensive purposes. That's what has been said, meaning they're there to shoot down missiles and drones. But an aircraft carrier that has weapons that can shoot down drones can also blow up Iranian military facilities, Iranian oil facilities, nuclear facilities. Iran has to worry about those sorts of things when you have that kind of U.S. military force ominously right over there. Now, one thing the U.S. could do to help is to make some of this clear, that there are scenarios imaginable in which Iran truly crosses lines. Those U.S. military forces could do more than defense. Well, but just on that point, Elliot, absolutely correct. But do we know if they've delivered that message privately? We don't know. The message that has been delivered is that the American interest is in tamping down the escalation on both sides. And so what does that mean? It means, Iran, you shouldn't launch a major attack because we're going to stop it and shoot it down. But also Israel, in response, you shouldn't do anything major going back against Iran. So they sort of have it both ways. They have a strong deterrent against Iran just by having those military assets there, but they undermine it somewhat by letting the Iranians know that they don't want Israel responding too harshly. Either. All right. Uh, we shall await, like everybody else, what Iran decides to do. Now, another Issue related here, very current and ongoing, is the status of negotiations over a ceasefire in Gaza. The uh, United States president really, really wants one, has been pressing Benjamin Netanyahu, the uh, Israeli prime minister, to go along with the terms. Uh, Israel last week agreed to the latest terms that the U.S. and Qatar and Egypt had agreed to only to be uh, undermined by Hamas, which again rejected those terms. Let's listen to Ambassador Herzog again talk about the deal. We hope to get as many live hostages out as possible. It comes with a pause in our military operation for at least 42 days. And uh, <clears throat> in that period, uh, we hope that, uh, again, we can release as, uh, get out as many live hostages as possible every day that passes endangers their lives. Well, where do the negotiations stand now, Elliot? Americans were at pains over the weekend to say that uh, none of these missile exchanges in the northern Israel will have a negative effect on the negotiations. So we've seen another round of the pattern that you had mentioned, which is Israel agrees to a U.S. brokered compromise. Hamas says, no, it's not enough. And then the Arab mediators come back and say, listen, it's really not enough. Israel has to make more concessions or else this is going nowhere. Biden administration is left somewhere in between those Arab mediators and Israel. Now, I guess I would point to a few things. One is that Israel itself is divided on this, and not just the Israeli population, but the Israeli government and state. The Israeli security establishment thinks that Israel can get away with more concessions, thinks that it can pretty much abandon crucial areas that block Hamas from rearming. Why? Because of something that Ambassador Herzog hinted at in that statement when he said at least 42 days. Israel is focusing only on the first phase of a deal. And everyone there thinks 
after 42 days, there won't be a second phase, a third phase. They can get right back. But that's a real question and not everyone. I don't agrees. think that's the expectation of the United States and the Biden administration. I think their expectation is when you sign a ceasefire, we'll call it phase one. It's going to be the end. And I think that's right because 42 days from now, that's 42 days closer to the U.S. election. So there are some real risks there. And from the Israeli prime minister's office, you will get a different view. I mean, um, the security establishment thinks a deal is the only way to stop escalation in the north with Hezbollah. Prime minister's office isn't so sure that a deal will stop that conflict, because even if Hezbollah stops shooting, the fight doesn't end until Israeli civilians can move back to their homes in the north. And if Hezbollah is poised there in southern Lebanon, ready to resume shooting at any time, I'm not so sure that many Israelis are going to move back. So very difficult questions there. 